Okay, good morning and welcome to the week two start. We start with lesson seven, efficiency and regulation of cellular respiration. And again, if you recall back from previous lessons on Friday, we're gonna really take a look in terms of the detail of how that NADH and, and how that citric acid cycle and FADH work, and then the real specifics of ATP production and consumption at different stages, because we just kind of looked at the general process on Friday. We didn't really go into too much detail, and, and I'm not gonna go into too deep of detail because there are still a lot of processes that are gonna be a mystery for you all for at least a couple more years until you, if you decide to take some type of formal biology university undergraduate studies, just because there's so many intricacies that happen at the cellular level to kind of produce and use ATP. So uh, recall that that NADH and hydrogen ions are, are produced through glycolysis, uh, pyruvate oxidation, as well as the citric acid cycle, as well as those two FADHs which are produced during that citric acid cycle per one glucose molecule. So the FADH and NADH, as well as that hydrogen ion, are all what's called those electron carriers that we talked about. They're very important because when we get to that electron transport chain, that ETC, the key thing that you need to recall about each of those steps, those stages of cellular respiration, once it gets to that electron transport chain, we're looking for the bulk of production of ATP to be produced as a result of that electrochemical gradient that the electron carriers create by donating electrons to those carrier proteins. And then that increasing in electronegativity for each carrier protein will attract those electrons. And then ultimately it will allow for that gradient to be formed to create those ATP. Now, the most important thing to recognize here is we're looking at now specifics of how much ATP is produced per electron carrier. So in my notes, I have that ATP output during the electron transport chain is three ATP per one NADH. So three ATP per one NADH, and then two ATP per one FADH. So it comes to a total of for every NADH, which we have 10. So that means we get 30 ATP for all the NADH. And then we have two FADH2s, which means we get four ATP produced by uh, FADH in the electron transport chain. Now, this is the maximum number possible that can be produced in the electron transport chain. And as, uh, I can't remember who it was, was it Leo or Andrew, or maybe it was Sarman who talked about the efficiency, it's not always gonna be 100%, right? And, and this calculation or these models that we look at, it assumes that it's gonna be 100% effective, uh, but it's really only about 41% effective, right? Not even 50%. It, it's really only about 41% effective. And, and the reason it's only 41% effective is because of several factors that we've kind of already alluded to, right? That's why when all of you are talking and asking about that entropy component, how often is it gonna come up? Here we go again. Some of that energy, unfortunately, just becomes unusable. Even though we're looking at that extragonic uh, production of free energy to utilize, sometimes it just doesn't get properly utilized. The bond breaks in such a way that the energy can't be harnessed. Uh, the electron doesn't fully directly connect with that electron transport carrier chain protein, and it is then therefore utilized and waste, uh, not, not utilized and wasted. And ultimately, uh, we have a lot of energy that also gets released as heat. When we think about those exothermic reactions, again, when we think of entropy, that heat loss of energy, which is no longer free energy use, is, is essentially a waste. So when you think about how effective it actually is at producing ATP, it's not even 50% effective, right? It's not even 50% effective. So assuming we get only 41% of the ATP that are produced, you're looking at under 17 ATP production per glucose molecule. So at, in the electron transport chain, that is. So there's a lot of, of potential to have that energy wasted. And it's important to remember that and recognize that again, that entropy component, entropy will always triumph, always. So recall that NADH molecules are produced during glycolysis in the cytosol but they're needed for the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. So in order for that to happen, we gotta get that NADH 
into that mitochondria. So we have what's called the maltate aspartate shuttle, which is a highly efficient, highly efficient carrier protein that brings NADH from the cytosol into the mitochondria. And when I say highly efficient, I'm talking about it does not waste energy. It does not waste energy. So it utilizes, I want to say from what I remember, it's like 96% of the energy that gets put into that maltate aspartate shuttle or MAS shuttle, 96 to 98%. I can't remember how much it is off the top of my head. It's not really important, but it's incredibly efficient. So the energy you put into that protein shuttle, it uh, basically utilizes the vast majority of it to bring NADH into that mitochondria. And I have a little note there that says most cells utilize it. There are some cells that don't utilize it, which is just more of like an interesting point to think about. So another aspect with regards to shuttling NADH into, or the energy that NADH holds into the mitochondria is the glycerol phosphate shuttle. And this glycerol phosphate shuttle now takes some of those electrons from NADH and it brings it to the FAD plus across the membrane meaning we have two less ATP produced now as a result of the uh, electron being transferred from the NADH to that FAD+. Okay, so this is, again, these membrane proteins that work to bring in the energy that's stored in that NADH, which is made in the cytosol. It's going to be utilizing those proteins to bring in either the NADH with that maltate aspartate shuttle, or it's going to bring the electrons that NADH holds and give it to FAD. But again, because we're going to have two less ATP produced as a result of converting NADH electron energy into that FAD plus, and it's because we have to consider this little chart, right? Three ATP per one NADH, it's only going to be two ATP for one FADH2. So the electrons that you take from the NADH, one goes to the FAD plus, one goes to FAD plus, we're looking at one less energy per NADH electron transferred to FAD+. So why do we study cellular respiration? What is the big reason we take a look at cellular respiration in a biological sense? Well, it allows for us to kind of talk about what's called metabolic rates. Recall that when we talk about metabolic rates or anything being metabolized, Metabolism or metabolism refers to the set of reactions occurring in our cells that essentially keep us alive. Any type of catabolic or anabolic reaction that's either breaking down particles, like in, uh, in catabolic reactions, or breaking or uh, building larger particles or molecules with that anabolic reaction. So those two things make up what's, that, what's called metabolism, and that it's those set of reactions that basically keep us alive or keep a cell alive or cells alive. So the metabolic rate is the amount of energy used per unit of time in an organism. It represents an overall average rate. Again, I can't stress how important it is to say the overall average rate of both anabolic and catabolic reactions. Again, it's only the overall average rate because as that question that was asked earlier in today, we can't really look at each individual cell and that under that microscope and then calculate how much that energy use is simply because some cells are so different. Some cells are so different from each other that looking at that individual cell doesn't really lend itself to an accurate picture of, of metabolic rate as a whole. When you think about your muscles, when you think about your brain cells that are constantly, constantly, constantly using huge amounts of energy, huge amounts of energy versus something like your skin cell, which is, for lack of a better word, just kind of hanging out, right? It still has metabolic processes it needs to do, and it is still very important, but it doesn't use anywhere close to as much energy as your muscles or as your brain cells. So it allows for us to look at something called the basal metabolic rate, or BMR, which is the metabolic rate at rest, and this is just to maintain body temperature, allow for digestion, breath, etc. This is and repair and, and all that type of stuff. This is just at rest, okay? Basal metabolic rate is just at rest. It's very difficult to in, in include aspects of non-rest, like going for a run, um, talking on a Google Meet when you're teaching biology on a Monday morning. It's very difficult to incorporate some of those aspects to create an average, so we just look at that rest rate. 
to kind of help us determine metabolic rate. So what are some factors that affect it? Age, height, weight, fat to muscle ratio, heredity, overall health, how much activity you do. So many different factors affect that basal metabolic rate uh, that it's important to keep in mind that several factors uh, will contribute to it. My favorite one to talk about as I get older myself and I work with teenagers, so it's very easy for me to make that direct connection. Uh, right now, when you are a 16, 17, 18 plus year old person, your metabolic rate, especially at rest, is through the roof relative to someone like me. Uh, I remember when I was your age, I used to eat like it was going out of style and nothing would happen to me as a result of it because my metabolic rate was through the roof at rest relative to now where I'm like, Oof, can I have this extra cheeseburger? Probably not. And so it's interesting just to kind of compare those parallels. Now I, I bet many of you can just look at food and be like, yep, I'm hungry, so therefore I eat. And uh, it's interesting to consider your basal metabolic rate at rest now versus when you age. And so, yeah, when we talk about that overall, it's every single cell, every single cell. It's an average of every single cell. So how is that metabolic rate? How is that metabolic rate important? Why is it important? What does it help us understand? It, it really helps us to understand the aspects of regulation of cellular respiration because cellular respiration occurs at the same rate in every cells. It's, it's a misnomer, right? It's a misnomer. And, and we know this to be true because that BMR, that basal metabolic rate, it's that average aspect of all cells. If we didn't, if we, if we needed to, to think about a specific cell and compare and contrast those specific cells, metabolic rates, it, so again, like I said, that muscle versus skin cell is a really good example for why we shouldn't uh, just assume that they all consider or they all consume the same amount of oxygen and glucose at the same rate. Some cells are going to be wanting to increase or decrease the rate of cellular respiration as a result of several different factors. The first is that these different rates and frequencies of cellular respiration in each cell at different times allow for it to kind of control and, and modulate how much oxygen and how much um, glucose those cells need. So it's going to increase when active and decrease when inactive. And anyone who's ever run for a bus or gone for a jog or anything of those sorts can already see those direct connections. And when we look at homeostasis and the, the processes and the pathways that are responsible for detecting all of these factors changing, you'll start to see why, okay, if I start to exert myself physically by going for a run, my breathing is going to increase, my heart rate is going to increase. And all of those are an attempt to help facilitate that increase in cellular respiration processes that the cells need to do as a result of the increase in activity. So now all of the things that we've learned about enzymes, feedback inhibition, allosteric regulation, it's really going to start to come into play because we're going to apply those concepts to the ideas of cellular respiration. So recall, Allosteric site is an area on an enzyme that binds a regulator, an activator, or an inhibitor. This is going to help control some of the processes of cellular respiration. Because if you recall, many, 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 many of the proteins and enzymes that are responsible for breaking things down in cellular respiration are proteins and enzymes. And as a result of that, we can start to control via allosteric regulation, activation, or inhibiting we can start to control some of those processes of cellular respiration. So notice that ATP and citrate, that first compound in the citric acid cycle, block the enzyme PFK or phosphofructokinase. So in this diagram, right, in this diagram, we have this enzyme that's present, PFK, phosphofructokinase, all right? When it is... In, the, in, in glycolysis, that process that, or sorry, in citric acid cycle, that process of create, creating that ATP and that citrate or that citrate, it acts as an inhibitor for the enzyme of PFK. So it's going to block the enzyme ability to, to do anything else. So what is the whole important component of this? Well, the aspect of it is in terms of the steps of glycolysis, as well as in terms of enzyme breakdown of, of those particles from glycolysis to the citric acid cycle and further on, 
Uh, if at any point in time we have something that negatively inhibits an enzyme production in that pathway, we can see this as an example as a negative feedback loop. That negative feedback loop is that the products will shut the process off. Once those products reach a specific concentration, which we don't really have to go into too much detail about how much it is, but once that ATP and citrate become overly saturated within the membrane, it's going to shut down that PFK. And as a result of that, we see this as a negative feedback loop. So what happens when that PFK is inhibited? Well, that fructose 1,6-biphosphate is not produced. And that is just a molecule that uh, is going to be utilized in, in turn. It's like one of the intermediates before pyruvate. And this slows down the process and even outright stops the process of glycolysis. And therefore, it stops the remainder of cellular respira respiration processes. Because when you recall, glycolysis, that process as a whole, as well as the idea of what it utilizes and what it breaks down and what it produces for later steps of cellular respiration, if you stop that process in glycolysis, it's going to really halt everything else after the fact. So this really helps. It really helps with the cell saving resources. It's really going to help those cells save that glucose, save that ATP, save those enzymes for other usage. And as a result of that, that resources can then be utilized either later or they can get transported to cells that need that energy. So likewise, when ATP levels are low, we're going to look at that adenosine monophosphate, AMP, and ADP can activate, they can activate that PFK enzyme so glycolysis can continue. So once ATP starts getting used up, getting used up, getting used up, and it gets turned into that ADP, as well as AMP, which we haven't really talked about, but it's again that adenosine monophosphate. Uh, once it starts to break down that ATP into those phosphate ions and the precursor to ATP, those molecules now, those molecules now activate that PFK. So they bump out, they bump out the ATP, they bump out the, uh, the citrate, and they now bind to those allosteric sites to activate PFK, which will now start to do all of its enzyme processes to create those intermediates that leads to pyruvate, which allows for the production of ATP through the entire cellular respiration process. So in what situations would that AMP or ADP be in high concentrations in the cell? Well, when ATP is low, recall, ATP is that storage of free energy. When that phosphate group breaks off to consume that energy for cellular processes, the ATP and the ADP kind of just like hang out now. And if they're not being utilized to create more ATP via the uh, citric acid cycle and then glycolysis and what have you in the electron transport chain, it's just going to kind of hang out in the cell and in the mitochondria. So when ATP is low, you have an increasing concentration of ADP. And that increasing concentration will help to activate that PFK protein. Another example is that when a cell has used high amounts of ATP, like when you exercise specifically in muscles, that ATP is now used to produce that mechanical motion and that kinetic motion. Once that ATP is used up, again, same concept. ADP isn't going to be in high concentration, and it can activate that PFK enzyme so that glycolysis can kind of get kick-started back up again. Okay, so when we talked about cellular respiration, we've talked about glucose, and we've talked about glucose as exclusively as the means with which the cell uh, produces ATP and utilizes the uh, aerobic respiration. But we talked a little bit about fats, and we talked a little bit about how they contain technically more energy per gram than carbs. And alternatively, that high energy nutrients like other carbohydrates, fats, and protein, they are also a process, uh, are in a process with regards to aerobic respiration. Um, so yeah, the AMP, uh, I'm not gonna, it's AMP, ADP is the main thing, but just recall that ADP and AMP are kind of like the same thing, just a little bit different, but ultimately, they were looking at comparing not ATP and ATP with regards to that. So again, those alternate to, alternatives to glucose, um, when you look at fats, when you look at carbs, when you look at proteins, 
these involve their own distinct reactions in order to be a part of that cellular respiration process. They can be utilized to produce energy in the cell, but they kind of have to go through some changes beforehand, right? Because recall, the cellular respiration pro process, it needs to utilize glucose. So additional reactions need to happen to those, or to those other carbohydrates, fats, and proteins in order for it to kind of get into that glycolysis and get into that cellular respiration process. So the energy storage pathway is going to look at converting excess glucose and fats or what have you, extra in, or nutrients. It's going to process it and it's going to store it. And glycogen is stored in the liver. Fats are stored in fat cells. Glycogen and fats are both utilized to basically store up energy that the cells don't need in that given moment. And so it's going to take all that excess store or that excess energy in forms that are not necessarily needed right now as in glucose or in other forms like fat and protein, and it's going to store it as energy elsewhere. So recall that those carbohydrates are hydrophilic. They will attract water molecules within the body. For this reason, fat is more energy efficient storage because it's more, uh, is a more energy efficient storage. The reason being is that they're nonpolar and hydrophobic. Uh-oh, what just happened? Well, that's not good. Sorry, folks. Um, huh. Bear with me one moment, folks. Sorry about that. My screen decided to stop sharing. Unable to access, that's not good. Oh dear, what a wrench. I'll do my best to edit this part out of the video. It is still not sharing. All right, let's try this again. Hmm. Okay, I am going to pivot. I am going to pull up the notes for today. Mm -mm. Sorry about this, folks. Sometimes technology is not always going to be cooperating with us, but no fear. We are essentially at the end of the lesson. So I will pivot quickly to this. And my hope is that you can all see that. Yes, you can. Excellent. So the last thing I really wanted to talk about with regards to fats and with regards to why they are a better storage mechanism for energy, it's that they're nonpolar and hydrophobic. So fats in our body do not include any additional weight from water and they don't pull any water away from processes that are required. They also don't store water um, because you can't, storing water in cells is bad for multiple reasons. Uh, one of which is that it, it's desperately needed in that cellular respiration process. So having that water stored is, is not good, as well as other functions. But essentially that the key component here is that that nonpolar hydrophobic nature of fat allows for it to be better stored as energy, and it doesn't include any additional weight from water. Okay, that is it for lesson seven. Uh, sorry about the little hiccup towards there at the end, um, but there are some activities as well as some other stuff within the student folder, which I guess I can kind of pull up right now and show you. Uh, the aerobic cellular respiration questions have answers to it. The introduction to glycolysis, uh, my hope is that you've already finished that, and you've also looked at that citric acid cycle, but all of these, all of these uh, additional questions can be utilized for your practice and for your homework now. Okay, folks, that's it. I'm gonna stop recording and I will answer questions if you have them.